Well, hello, gay people and homosexuals. Um, I have put on a little outfit and sat down to talk with you today about representation, which is something that uh, we have been talking about on the blog a lot recently, um, but I feel like I still have a lot more to say about it. So I'm gonna do that here. Um, mostly I'm just going a little bit bonkers um, being inside my house, so I thought I would chat to you guys. Um, but the thing I really want to talk about and I guess get better at thinking about is sort of historicizing this um, push for representation um, because I think it has become very naturalized and that it seems like a normal um, thing to ask for from media and to talk about uh, when we talk about different kinds of fictional texts um, and I just don't think that that's like true. <laughs> Um, I think it is the product of a very specific set of historical circumstances. Um, like there are reasons that we, um, in this particular moment, in this particular sort of political economy, um, are looking to fiction and to fictional texts, um, for this sort of like mirroring this, um, wanting to be seen in a particular way, um, wanting to feel some kind of authenticity um, from fiction. And I'm not a historian, I'm just a guy on the internet. Um, but to me, it seems like t a combination of two things. Um, one is, I mean, I think just your very bare bones, like, you know, we live in hell, by which I mean late stage capitalism. Um, and so there's this sort of sublimation of all the things that we don't have time or energy for in our real lives due to we're being crushed by um, alienated labor. Um, a sublimation of all of those sort of things into fiction, um, because what do we have energy for at the end of the workday? Um, not to go out and live our dreams, but certainly to lie on the couch and watch TV and watch someone else live those dreams um, and experience at least, you know, some of that catharsis vicariously. Um, so, I mean, I think it makes total sense that there's such a level of investment in um, fictional worlds and fictional characters and the things that they're doing and the ways that they're living because... Um, I think in, in large part, we're not able to live the way that we would like to be living. Um, so that checks out to me. Um, the other piece of it, I think, is this idea, um, and I don't know where it comes from, but the idea that visibility or that representation um, is commensurate with some kind of like political change or um, societal progression, the idea that um, if our fictional worlds, especially in the mainstream, are more diverse, if they showcase um, a wider range of experiences, of lifestyles, of cultures, uh, that society as a whole will become more accepting. Um, I don't think that's true, but I do think we think that. Um, and there's a couple I want, I want to quote, um, because that's just who I am, um, but there are a couple um, passages on this sort of idea of like misplaced, this misplaced um, confidence in the political product of visibility that have been really helpful for me. Um, and one is um, from Sarah Schulman's um, book about familial homophobia, it's called The Ties That Bind. Um, and she says, visibility was a construct that the gay and lesbian movement invented, which I don't know if that's true, but I think the rest of this is true. Uh, a construct that they invented to explain and excuse the cruelty we were experiencing. 
We denied that it was intentional. Instead, we invented the idea that it was an inadvertent consequence of heterosexuals having a lack of information about what we were really like. If they would discover how we truly are, they would not want to hurt us. And since they were doing everything imaginable, using every social institution to make it impossible for us to truly be seen, we would have to subject ourselves to extreme violation in order to force a cathartic experience for them that would make them better. This process required shock troops of certain stupendously courageous gay and lesbian individuals to come out and be fully subjected to the force of punishment, thereby creating the inevitable social change that we felt would accompany recognition. Some of us forced them to see us, expecting that once they would see us, they would love us, and then realize that our disenfranchisement was morally wrong, and they would then join with us in correcting these structures of exclusion, both emotional and social. The plan was that the vanguard homosexuals willing to take the punishment would then make things easier for other, less courageous ones looking on from the wings waiting for this battle to achieve a more equitable field. These others could then enter the process with progressively fewer degrees of loss, but filled with recognition for their brave predecessors and what we had done for them. Looking back at the way we created the issue of visibility as a strategy for change is a painful confrontation with the realization that it was an engagement with magical thinking. We believed that straight people hurt and hate us because they don't know us. If we could have visibility, they would realize that we are fine and would accept us. This theory has been disproven by history. So that's Sarah Schulman. Um, and I just think that's so true. Um, it's really, I, I, and I know this is true for me, it's really hard to let go of the idea um, that people just don't have enough information that if they just like, heard the right argument or read the right paper or book or watched the right interview, um, met the right person, um, that things would be different. And it just has not played out that way. Um, not to say that on an individual level, you know, someone can't see a show with a gay person in it and be like, wow, gay is good. Um, but I like, you know, just sort of on a, on a larger scale, on a, um, social or, you know, sort of gay and lesbian movement scale that just like really, I don't think that um, works as Shulman is saying. I think another place we see that is in what's called this um, phenomenon of the transgender tipping point, um, which I, most of my knowledge and reading about that comes from um, Trapdoor, um, which is an anthology edited by Eric Stanley and someone else, Raina Gossett, I think. Um, highly recommend. You can definitely find a PDF online. Um, but they include an interview um, with um, a couple of trans elders um, talking about what it means to have grown up through the trans rights movement and now be living in what we might consider an age of uh, trans visibility. Um, so this interviewer is asking Miss um, Major Griffin Gracie about, um, you know, just sort of like what it's like to see Laverne Cox on TV and what, what that feels like. Uh, and this is what she says. There's a backlash. It's a very wonderful thing that Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time. It's a monumental thing. Before today, occasionally a person would get mainstream attention like Christine Jorgensen, but this is the first article that was geared toward us as a community. She's a black woman and she's trans and she's in what people consider the profession, she's an actress. But with that newfound visibility, there's always a reverse reaction. People all around the world were amazed by Laverne's cover story. However, for the girls who have to live on the streets and off their wits, this was not something that was beneficial to their existence. What I have noticed since that happened is that there are more girls being murdered or beaten up because the people who want to do these harmful things can't get to Laverne Cox. She's in a world that they can't even dream about approaching. She's basically out of their reach with the security that she has. Girls like me, we don't have that security. So somebody can really dislike the fact that trans is gaining acceptance and think, oh, there's a trans girl on the cover of Time. Oh, there's one of those trans bitches there and go and kill her. Another trans woman pays the price for what the media is applauding and the world is getting all happy over. There are two sides to every coin. Nothing is as simple as it appears to be. How to negotiate that or mediate it carefully is hard to do. So again, talking about this idea um, of visibility and what does visibility actually produce? Um, 
And so not only in this case is it not producing this sort of um, incremental progression, this gradual acceptance, um, but in at least the case of trans people and trans women in particular and black trans women in particular in particular, um, it has really led to a measurable increase in violence um, that sort of comes along with this increased visibility. Um, so, yeah, I think we really just have to question and be critical of this idea that visibility, representation, um, whatever you want to call it, is a, is a good thing, is something that is going to be beneficial or something that, you know, might have its drawbacks, but it's something that we just have to put up with um, because it's going to get us where we want to go eventually. Um, I also feel like we lose sight of what parts of the human experience are, you know, sort of resist representation or maybe are not um, representable. And those sorts of things sort of um, fall to the wayside as we really become obsessed with this like currency of re representation and are thinking about, well, what's the like best, most true, most clear, authentic way to um, portray this marginalized experience. Um, this is something I've been thinking a lot about recently um, because I've been very sick um, and I'm sick with many things, but one of them is chronic fatigue. Um, and that's something that just like really does not lend itself to being represented fictionally. Not that I'm necessarily asking for that, um, but you know, if I were to think about, for example, a character that has chronic fatigue, like what does that look like? Okay, that person stays at home, like is in bed, doesn't come out of their room, can't answer like phone calls or texts, um, you know, can't, is not verbal sometimes. Like those sorts of things are just sort of like, you know, if, if you're a character, you know, if, you know, when you're a character, um, if you're a character, you have to be able to act, you have to move the plot forward, you have to um, be affected by the world around you, you have to interact um, and sort of like be present in a fictional world. And so what does it mean or what would it look like to sort of deal with these modes of being that are really more absence than presence or that are sort of characterized by their lack um, of signifier? Um, and I'm, I'm, that's not to say that people haven't sort of explored that in fiction. Um, you know, we love a plotless book, we love a characterless book, we love a book about a ghost, um, or a hole or something that's a prominent absence, shall we say. Um, but I just think there are sort of like lots of experiences that get left behind or get sort of devalued culturally because they're not um, easily communicable. They're not um, easy to translate, um, whether to page or screen. Something similar came up when I was reading, um, what's it called? Oh, um, Furious Feminisms, I think. It's like a, a sort of baby book. It's on the, I think it's like fully available online too, but um, sort of like critical analysis of um, Mad Max Fury Road, my friend Mad Max Fury Road. Um, but one of the essays is called Is the Future Disabled by Michael Gill. And he had this passage where he said, how can we convert into image and narrative the disasters that are slow moving and long in the making, disasters that are anonymous and that star nobody, disasters that are attritional and of indifferent interest to the sensation driven technologies of our image worlds. So again, this idea of like, what are the things that we live with, but that don't, again, just like don't translate easily. And are we, what are we missing when we're focusing on um, these sort of, I, I don't wanna say like easily representable because I, you know, what is easily representable, but things that are more commonly represented in media. Um, what are like our, collective blind spots? Um, what are the things that we're not seeing? What are the things that we're leaving out? Um, what are the things that we just like have not 
developed our collective muscles um, in terms of talking about. Um, Lauren Berlant said something similar in Slow Death, um, which to be fair, I haven't finished, but I, the part that I read, I did like, um, but they said, just sort of echoing um, Michael Gill, but um, theirs reads, we need better ways to talk about activity oriented toward the reproduction of ordinary life the burdens of compelled will that exhaust people taken up by managing contemporary labor and household pressures, or spreading out activities like sex or eating oriented toward pleasure or self-abeyance that do not occupy time, decision, or consequentiality in anything like the registers of autonomous self-assertion. So, I mean, again, if what, sort of going back to what I said in the beginning, if we're going to fictional texts, uh, as an escape from the uh, crushing reality of um, the world we currently live in, it makes sense that those texts are not, we're not looking to those texts to reproduce um, what Berlant calls the burdens of compelled will that exhaust people. Um, it makes sense that we're not necessarily interested in seeing that um, because we already live it. Um, but, you know, shouldn't we be better at talking about those things? Wouldn't it be more politically fruitful if those were the things that we focused on, or if not focused on, at least like included in our conversations? Um, and even though it makes sense to want to ignore those things and to look away from them, I think, not to say that's exactly what they want, but isn't that exactly, um, what is most helpful in sort of keeping the system intact. So I've sort of been talking about um, things that resist representation, um, sort of like the limit cases of representation or the flaws that that might have as like a metric or a um, paradigm. But I also have been thinking about, um, I guess even more than like resistance to representation, like the refusal to be represented or the, um, illusion of representation. Um, I read this week um, Histories of the Transgender Child by Jules Gill Peterson, um, which ended up being like an extremely granular sort of like close reading of medical records um, of trans children who came into contact with um, like early gender clinics uh, in the 20th century. Um, but she makes the point um, that, like, obviously having those records is of huge interest to us in the current moment, and it allows us to have a clear picture of, um, what was going on at that time, but every record is also, like, a sign of a child coming into contact with a medical institution that 90% of the time ended up being, like, incredibly harmful. Um, you know, these clinics were not, like, granting people access to transition at that time. Um, so like the records that we have access to are like, um, people being diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, or like being institutionalized, um, in various ways or being outright rejected, um, by medical professionals, um, being experimented on and studied even as they were denied, um, diagnosis or treatment, that sort of thing. So really thinking about the idea that um, marginalized people historically are not, have not been befriended by record keeping institutions, right? Like there is a historical antagonism there. Um, and so we can think about records or moments of visibility as these moments of capture um, by apparatus of the state. Um, and think about moments where there is no visibility, there is no representation, you know, there is an erasure or a lacuna in the archive um, as a moment of escape um, or obscurity in the positive sense. Um, there's a couple people who I've been reading and thinking about that. Um, the first one is um, Sadia Hartman, and this is from her book, Scenes of Subjection, um, which I also confess to having not read in full, um, but she's talking about um, spirituals and slave songs 
um, and she sort of like prefaces her reading of those texts um, with this. Hence, my task is neither to unearth the definitive meaning of song or dance, nor to read song as an expression of Black character, as was common among 19th century ethnographers, ethnographers, but to give full weight to the opacity of these texts wrought by toil, terror, and sorrow, and composed under the whip and in fleeting moments of reprieve. Rather than consider Black song as an index or mirror of the slave condition, this examination emphasizes the significance of opacity as precisely that which enables something in excess of the orchestrated amusements of the enslaved, and which similarly troubles distinctions between joy and sorrow and toil and leisure. For this opacity, the subterranean and veiled character of slave song must be considered in relation to the dominative imposition of transparency, and degrading hypervisibility of the enslaved. And therefore, by the same token, such concealment should be considered a form of resistance. Furthermore, as Glissant advises, and this is a quote, the attempt to approach a reality so hidden from view cannot be organized in terms of a series of clarifications. The right to obscurity must be respected for the accumulated hurt, the rasping whispers deep in the throat the wild notes and the screams lodged deep within confound simple expression and likewise withstand the prevailing ascriptions of black enjoyment. So this phrase, the right to obscurity, um, is something that I've really been thinking with. And just the idea that like one of the basic freedoms that everyone should have access to is the freedom to, um, go under the radar almost, you know, to um, not be recorded, to be invisible if you so choose, to be anonymous, um, to be free of surveillance, to be unintelligible, incommunicable, untranslatable, um, yeah. But I really just think it is a little bit wild um, that we sort of view um, entrance into the historical record as this sort of like uh, unimpeachable good. Um, that it's good to get as much of yourself out there as possible, um, whether by putting it on the internet or writing a really revealing memoir or, I don't know, not only being famous your whole life, but then also commissioning a biopic, like it, the list goes on. Um, this sort of cultural value that we put on, um, exposure of the self and examination of someone's inner workings and I just it there is a lot of I think violence in that I mean historically as we've discussed um but even now I mean I don't know I don't I guess I don't understand why more people don't feel like sort of trapped um because i certainly do feel trapped um when people think they can explain myself to me um when people point at like flattened these sort of like cardboard characters in like movies or um these just sort of like vague outlines um of people and think that that like tells them something about me. I know I've already talked um, a bit about how the push for representation to me just like sucks as a political goal. Um, and that, you know, because like in itself, it just does nothing. Um, but I think there's also an extent to which it sort of like actively detracts from things that we could be doing that would actually be effective. Um, there is a sense in which our, you know, the, the sort of limited collective energy that we do have after getting home from work 
and lying on the couch, um, is put into these like efforts to like renew Brooklyn Nine Nine or that like um, protest that they had in Times Square when the OA was canceled. How like that really? We live in hell. Um, but this like using these like. I hesitate to say organizing tactics because I don't, it's not that people aren't doing, it's not that sophisticated, um, but, do, you know, going, doing these, like, actions and petitions and, like, for, and the goal of it is to diversify mainstream media to, um, prolong the release of shows that people feel are diverse or representative um just to achieve things that do not correspond i think to any material change in the lives of anyone who's like not working on you know whatever show is being renewed um and i found this um I'm just gonna do another quote. We're gonna do another quote. Um, I, but I was on the interwebs recently and saw this um, quote from an interview that Kathleen Hanna did in the 90s um, that I think speaks to this exact idea. Um, and she's talking about like basically having strong female characters in media and what does that mean um, for like radical feminist movement. And she says, there's a woman named Morgan Starr who wrote for Sinister Wisdom, which was a feminist publication in the 70s, and she says, The more the mainstream changes to appear more inclusive, yet essentially remains non-inclusive, the harder it is for people to stand outside that system and question what's within it. As we have these images of women that seem a lot more positive, it becomes a lot harder for women who are doing real work, and I don't think Batman has anything to do with real work or real coalition or real change, as a lot of people get the idea that look, there are these strong characters of women and portrayals of women and people of color and lesbians, you know, the more that my dad or your dad or whoever gets the idea that everything's changed, the harder it is for us to get grant money to do all different kinds of things because to them we've come a long way, baby, and it's all changed. I know that is not change, it is not real change. So, yeah, I mean, I hate to sound like a tin hat wearing conspiracy theorists but I really do think there is something to this idea of like being lulled into a sense of complacency and security by seeing these image worlds you know on screen or on page that are inclusive diverse um progressive um because it it helps you to believe that um society is changing in a way that mirrors that um but we are not making more money we are not being discriminated against less we are not experiencing fewer hate crimes we're actually experiencing more hate crimes um we're not being accommodated in the workplace um we are not affording rent or property any more easily um So it really is this like mirage um, that might not necessarily have been, you know, created with like sinister intentions, you know, in order to uh, distract us or keep our eyes off the prize, if you will. Um, but I do think that is sort of the effect um, because people can, people will really point and say, well, like, look how many. Um, you know, show starring gay people came out this year. Congratulations, gay people. Um, you know, this is real progress. And it, like, that's not, those are, they're made up people. <laughs> um, it's a made up world. Um, congratulations to those gay actors who are getting paid. Um, but, like, that has no, that's like three gay people. Um, I, like, I just think if we spend our energy on doing anything else, anything else, um, but we don't, 
we do the OA dance in Times Square, which is a choice that you can make. I just think in, we like need to get more critical. We need to get more paranoid. As Miss Sedgwick told us, we need to get more skeptical um, of mainstream media and even like medium stream media. Um, and these sort of mechanics that function to incorporate marginalized people more firmly into mainstream society, but only in a way that um, produces hypervisibility in a way that invites violence without any attending like material benefits. And I, we, I just think like, why do we settle for that? And I really do include like me in the we of that. Like, I'm not trying to say that I'm above this impulse. I have been known to seek out homosexuals in media or transgender people in media or disabled people in media. Um, I am not immune to the wanting to feel seen or to live through a character that I relate to or to distract myself um, with a fictional reality that seems more hopeful than our real reality. Um, but, you know, at what cost at the end of the day? Um, and I, is there a way to is there a way to get beyond that and to even just in the way that we like think about and critique media is there something if you like peel away the how many bisexuals are in this book like what if you just like if we banned that from the conversation for like a year like how would we talk about texts and would that move us forward in any way? Like there just has to be something that's not how many fake people in this book or movie are fake transgender, you know what I mean? I think that is most of my thoughts. I may have more at a later time, in which case you can watch this space. Um, I know I just said a lot of stuff, but I really am interested in um, what others are thinking about this um, because I, you know, I'm, I don't want to pretend that I'm saying anything that's like changing the game um, or revolutionary in any way. I think I have a lot of friends online who are talking about similar things and are making similar critiques. Um, so all that to say, let me know what you think, um, genuinely, um, because I do want to discuss. I'm just like sitting in my house and I, and I want to, I want to chat. So I think that's it for now. And I will catch you all at a later time.